Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to BT Centre. I am Nick Heatley. I'm a network architect for BE, BT. I used to work uh, under the auspices of EE. I'm going to give you a, a joint BT EE update. Um, so the consumer broadband rollout has completed. We completed in October 2016. So um, all BT broadband lines support IPv6 with a compatible router, with the exception of legacy IP stream connections. It's supported by the new BT Consumer Smart Hub 6 today. And that's what's driving our, our numbers. Uh, on business, uh, we added support earlier this year. So business have a static IPv6 option on a slash 56. Uh, High-speed internet and VPN services have had V6 support for over five years. So we're adding um, new customer ads straight onto, on, onto the V6 option. If you're an existing cu customer, you may have to request that support. So those are the graphs from APNIC. So we're seeing about 25% penetration of IPv6 in the... Uh, in the BT network AS2856. Uh, sorry? Uh, I don't know. I just fancied APNIC today. <laughs> you by APNIC statistics and drive. APNIC are the ones who are actually publishing measurements uh, and it's easily accessible. I haven't seen any uh, comprehensive statistics from RIPE. I know they do measurements through RIPE Atlas um, and I know they've got some statistics but kind of APNIC have got the, the most information so that's why we are yeah, using it's it. But in it's the a public good point. Domain. Yeah. I don't think RIPE fancy Mm. Yeah, so I don't know if everybody heard, so Ian was just saying that basically RIPE probably don't want to avoid duplication of the work that uh, guys at APNIC are doing, because they're already doing a pretty good job. Okay, uh, so on to the EE update. Um, so these statistics you won't get in the public domain. Um, so we're seeing about 12% uh, of our of our internet traffic being IPv6 based. That's um, nearly entirely all um, from IPv6 only devices. So we launched IPv6 only at the end of 2017. Oh, that's wrong, isn't it? <laughs> oh dear. Uh, end of 2016. Um, on e-consumer post-pay with eligible handsets. Um, so why do we, um, why we not use the public domain information? Um, so in the, in the case of EE, we've got a mixed AS of fixed and mobile. And um, due to the way that they collect statistics, there seems to be a, a heavily bias towards the, um, towards the fixed. Um, tends to be because of the eyeballs that you get on the end of a, of a line. They're not counting lines, they're counting eyeballs. So um, fixed will have like a five, six times uh, waiting. So if you look at our public domain stats, you'll see it more like 1%, 2%. So this is the real insider's information. Um, interestingly, what we're also seeing is that uh, for every device on the mobile network that's IPv6 only, um, about 70% of the, the traffic by volume is uh, pure IPv6 to IPv6. Uh, the remainder is, is uh, going through the NAT64 through a, a function called 464XLAT or, or just straight NAT64, DNS64. Um, just a reminder of, um, of what our use cases were. Um, we've, we've switched on IPv6 for the voice IMS. Uh, APN, so that's uh, an IMS APN that's within its internal to EE, and that's all IPv6 enabled, so that drives our internal use of IPv6. Uh, on data, we have three key use cases to pick up. 
um, straight data from a handset, uh, data via a, a tethering connection, so Wi-Fi tethering, and then the mobile broadband use cases. We focused on data and, and tethered data. We have a single APN strategy that connects all of those uh, use cases to the internet. Um, so that's quite interesting, thinking about what happens next. If you're aware of um, other mobile operators in, say, North America, uh, they're getting great IPv6 penetration, IPv6 only, the likes of T-Mobile US, because uh, they've enabled IPv6 only on all their handset types. I think that's where we'd like to get to. Um, the challenge is that um, 464X LAP provides this tethered data connection. Um, it's, a, it's a good networking uh, connection for, for hosting other devices off the IPv6 only device. Um, if you're aware of a, another handset OS, it's going IPv6 only um, in a pure NAT64, DNS64 model. So we will need to think about how we evolve those, those use cases to, uh, to bring it on board. That's it from me. Thank you very much. Unless there's any questions. I'm going to ask a question. Uh, so my question is how many users do you actually have on the mobile in total? When you say 12%, I would like to put it to like how many So that's a traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how many subscribers or business and consumer um, like post pay? Do you know how many million do you have got? Um, so, I mean, in total, it's over 30 million. Okay. Yeah. But um, we brilliant. have two legacy brands. Mm -hmm. We've got the E brand, and not every connection is data orientated as well. So, um, so from that traffic profile, it's it's the total of of internet traffic, which seems to be a better actual statistic to use for us. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. But um, you, you know, it's it's over two million. It's over two million IP endpoints. Okay. Um, I, I noticed on your presentation for the BT section um, that um, uh, you commented it was just the version six CPEs. Um, are the um, in, oh, in previous six. presos you, you've always said, or BT have always said that that would be retrofitted to at least the five B? Is that not the case now? Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're looking at that, we're continually looking at that. Um, it, it's an economic case that we need to uh, evaluate to go back and, and, and touch those. At the moment, um, it's, it's uh, in the balance to actually go back and, and enable it. So at the moment, we're focusing on the Home Hub 6s. <coughs> have we got Hi. no mics? <laughs> we will have mics. <laughs> Not too bad. Uh, Tom Hill from Bikemark. I was just curious, actually, as to uh, whether or not you have any, uh, you found any applications that haven't been working with 464 XLAT, and whether or not, if you do find an application like that, do you drop the customer back to uh, the older dual stack or IPv4 only network, or do you just say lump it, go and complain to the content provider? Um, so. We haven't really found any incompatibilities with um, 464X LAT. It just works. In fact, the, the, the problems are generally where you assume devices have 464X LAT and, and for some reason that hasn't, hasn't worked. What we, what we do then is we create um, an APM profile that's just IPv4 based and the, the customer will, will be able to use IPv4 as normal. So a parallel profile on the, on the handset itself. But yeah, the actual um, problems with 464, 464 XLAT, we, we really haven't found any. Um, the most interesting problem, I think, is where um, we have found um, problems with DNS64, where a, a service is using a DNS-based lookup to identify an endpoint, and then that endpoint um, is actually preferring a, a, a literal connection, or, or you know, parts of a service are actually doing different things. So one part of the connection is a literal, one part's DNS-based, 
And, and in IPv4, that all gets married up perfectly fine, but in a NAT64, DNS64 model, you actually end up with different IP versions for the different connections. Um, and, you know, there's one simple way of fixing that. IPv6 enable your service. And then your problems go away. And that's what we need to do with talk back to the actual service owner. Um, so, I mean, that, that's just bad design as far as I'm concerned. It's not, not really a, a technology uh, problem. Uh, David Holder, Arion. Um, hi, Nick. Hi. Tethering, you mentioned that was holding you back. Could you expand on that a little bit on, on the issue with tethering? Uh, that was in the context of IPv6 only and using X4 X64 LAT, X LAT. Um, So, can I go back one on this? There we go. Um, so, in the US, let's talk generically. In the US, um, due to... Um, um, you know, the local billing and tariff rules, tethering tends to be done by a, a, a secondary APN and build out of another, another tariff. It's not naturally available on every tariff. So you will see different APNs for tethering from, from standard handset use. What that means is that you can take the main APN to be IPv6 only, say, and leave the tethering APN as IPv4 based. And because it's such a, a low usage APN in terms of customer numbers, that's fine in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, if you've got a common APN and the, the customer receives all services through a, a single APN, then you don't have that flexibility to, to take one to IPv6 only and one to stay on IPv4. So it's just a bit more involved. Yes, yeah, so sorry to... So this isn't a 464X well, we we This isn't sorry. a... Yeah. This isn't a 464 XLAT question. This isn't a 464 XLAT issue. That solves everything. <coughs> it's yeah. working in a world without 464 XLAT. Yeah. And you might know of a handset that uh, works in that way. Great, thank you. Uh, we do need to move on. We've got plenty of discussion time uh, for coffee breaks and lunch. So do catch Nick over those if you want to um, ask any more questions. Thanks thank very you. much, Nick. Cheers. That's Adrian. Oh. Sorry. That, that was going to be a surprise. <laughs> right. um, so some of you know me. I'm from Andrews and Arnold, or AAISP. Um, we also make firewalls and routers and LNSs and things. So I'm here as Firebrick Limited as well, um, which hopefully makes some sense. And when I started doing these slides, um, one of my friends, uh, actually our lawyer, said, IP6 Council, what's that? Is that the elders of the internet? And hence the slide was supposed to be a bit of a joke, but they put it up first, but never mind. We, we have one of these in our office, by the way. <laughs> um, OK, so really a bit of a question of what's to update here. We've been doing IP6 since 2002, so that's over 15 years now. and. Um, now, not as long as some people like Janet, I must admit, but uh, for quite a while. And quite a lot's changed over time, so I thought I'd try and explain some of that. Back in 2002, we couldn't get proper transit of any sort. We can get our IP6 allocation from Wipe, that was easy. But we actually had a, an IP4 tunneled thing. I think it was BT running it, to be honest. And most of our customers were tunneled over IP4 as well. The equipment we had at the time, um, BT provided Cisco router on a, on a BT central, couldn't really cope. But we were still providing IP6 one way or another. Of course, since then, it's all native IP6 now. The transit providers finally caught up. Uh, it was very strange, the first transit provider that offered us IP6, uh, might have been level three, um, said, okay, what's your tunnel endpoint? And we said, <laughs> go away and come back when you can actually do IP6. So they all do IP6 now, which is good. And because of the Firebrick kit that we make, we have no trouble actually supporting our customers with IP6 over the L2TP connections across people like BT and TalkTalk. So for a long time now, quite a number of years, uh, before World IP6 launch day, 
we've been providing customers with IP6 as standard. It wasn't, it, you know, before then, it was a tick box on the order form, do you want it? But we took that all away. If you don't want IP6, you have to come and ask us, but it's very unlikely that people are like that. And we have an IP6-capable router that we supply to customers. Nothing as fancy as BT's Home Hub. Obviously, we're buying off-the-shelf stuff. So IP6 is not the new kid anymore. So why does the auditorium Wi-Fi not have IP6? What's going on here? Okay? It's been around quite a long time now. CPE is still the issue. And this is obviously the sort of challenge people like BT have faced with updating their home hub. It's understandable. We're shipping out Zyxel routers at the moment. We have used quite a range of different routers. That's the model number of the latest one we've got. And it seems to be just working. The previous model we had from them sort of worked, but some people had issues. Sometimes they'd, they'd get a prefix delegation when they first turned it on and then it would disappear and things like this. It wasn't quite perfect. The latest ones seemed to be a lot better, um, even for things like TF069, which did fool me slightly, I must admit. Um, my, <laughs> I hadn't coded handling working out what IP6 address the, the TF069 was coming from, so very naughty of me. Um, Obviously, as an ISP selling IP6, we need to make sure all of our services are IP6. So that was one of the challenges we had. Now, a lot of our internal systems are just Linux-based, so IP6 from the start, nice and simple. Our Firebrick routers, the uh, BGP, L2TP, and even the, the smaller models we do as CPE, typically for businesses, were built with IP6 from scratch as part of the design from day one, which has made life a lot easier. And that has made it easy for us to deploy IP6. The actual LNS handles things like DHCP v6 for us. It's not a separate box. Uh, we did work with some of the early ADSL router manufacturers. I think Technicolor came into our offices at one point and we were doing quite detailed packet dumps and they were debugging code on their router because they wanted to make sure it worked with an ISP and we wanted to make sure that we'd found some CP that was going to work and we both had to make minor tweaks to get DHCP v6 and prefix delegation to work. And to be honest, I really don't like the whole way IP6 addresses are assigned to CPE. It would seem to be much nicer to do it over some sort of PPP type thing like IP4, but we're kind of stuck with it, so that's how we have to go. The last service we had to get working fully IP6 was our VoIP platform, which we moved over to our, our Firebricks. And it took us quite a while to do this, partly because it was turning out to be quite hard to find anything to do compatibility testing with because trying to find any VoIP stuff that did IP6 at all was a nightmare, and what we found didn't work. Um, these days it has improved. I think SNOM had a, a special build that was IP6 only, not IP4, for example, which was complicated, and, and then lots of things didn't like the, you know, the possibility of using IP6 literals in SIP headers. So yeah, it, was, it was a bit messy, but it's working now, which is good. Still very little take up of IP6 for VoIP, despite the fact that it solves all the horrible NAT problems you get with VoIP usually, which is a shame. End user acceptance. Well, not really an issue, to be honest. For many years, as you should all know, browsers, operating systems, pretty much everything just copes with IP6 and dual stack. So we're really not seeing any complaints from customers about the fact they've got IP6 on their line, which is good. There was a time many years ago when this wasn't the case, when browsers would stall for a while because they thought they'd got IP6 when they haven't. But the browsers have improved. The operating systems have improved. Things are working well. So mostly people are normal non-technical customers, and we do have a few non-technical customers, not many. Our normal customers don't even know they've got IP6. And the phrase was, when you, when you do things right, people don't know you've done anything at all. things right, people won't be sure you've done anything at all. I hope we have future armor fans here. Um, so looking at the IP6 allocations for customers. Now, I've seen recently that Ripe have actually got some proper guidance on this now, which is good. When we started, Ripe were very confused. Um, we were talking about doing a slash 64 for customers, at which point Ripe said, well, you can't have an IP6 block then, you haven't got enough customers which seemed a bit naive then, but it was back in 2002. 
they've changed their attitude somewhat since. Um, so the system we're still doing now is we're actually allocating a slash 48 to every new customer. But that's the customer. We have lots of customers with multiple lines or multiple sites, especially business customers. And so we set, set up our control pages. So having got their slash 48, they can choose how many blocks and what size blocks they want routed down each line and each site. But by default, for a consumer, they'll have a slash 64 routed to their line and plenty more within the slash 48 that they can use if they need. Uh, obviously, DHCP v6 pre uh, prefix delegation will have to handle that, and it does. It sends multiple blocks if the CPE asks for that. But generally, we're finding CPE just asks for one block and gets a slash 64. And there's some CPE around at the moment which gets very upset if you give it more than the 64, or try to. It'll ask for more, you give it more, and it sulks. So we have to, we have, to have configuration options to work around some of these for our customers. We do have a few IP6 only customers, mostly hack spaces. And some of them have got IP4 from another ISP and IP6 from us, and some of them are doing experimentation. Uh, we've got in our network a service to do the, the NAT64 and the DNS to allow IP6 only operation on broadband lines uh, running on our fabrics. So there are a few people experimenting, but obviously not very many. It's interesting to hear that EE have uh, mobile devices that are IP6 only and do the various translation. It's not so common with broadband customers. Um, we did have fun with source address filtering because obviously we all want to filter the source addresses of our customers, try and cut down on those pesky DOS attacks. Um, and obviously we have to do that for IP6 and IP4. And when we first set all this up, we ran into a problem where we're looking at six over four protocol 41 packets using us as a gateway to send IP6 packets that weren't the customer's IP6 space. So we had to make sure we filtered that as well. And then we ran into at least one customer who was magically using IP6, even though he hadn't actually got an IP6 prefix delegation and didn't have any clue what he was doing. Somehow his network was using 2.002 prefixed embedded IP4 addresses to talk to the internet on IP6, and he had no clue why. So we had to make sure we, we allowed those for many of the IP4 addresses we're routing to that customer, which was quite fun. Um, so things like this you may not have even thought about. Mostly you can probably ignore it because people doing that sort of weird stuff probably deserve all they get, but um, we did try. Um, now, this was embarrassing. Last week I was at Southampton University doing a talk and uh, apparently they've got some of their networks in, the, in Wi-Fi and so on where they're actually disabling IP6. I thought, what the hell was going on? This is crazy. Um, if you want a good example of a website that's IP6 only to use for someone, because obviously we get people saying, when there are websites that are only IP6, we'll deploy IP6, and you say, there's one. And then you have the whole argument, well, that's only one. Okay, exactly how many do there have to be before you're gonna deploy IP6? Is it one, 10, 100, 1,000? You know, um, it changes the argument somewhat. But it's only gonna get worse. So it does seem a little odd that they're doing that. And we spoke earlier of some of the challenges of getting businesses to adopt IP6. Well, what's going on when a university are setting up networks without IP6? deliberately. There's something weird going on there. It'll be interesting to find out why. But we all know IP6 is the future. I don't know whether you can see this slide. It's, uh, I, I do hope most of you read XKCD. If you don't, you really should. Um, so uh, shall I read it? Can you see that, everybody? If you can't, okay, Commander, come quick. There are na the nanobots, they've stopped. They've devoured 40% of the Earth and then just quit. They're just sitting there. Why? It's a mystery. Unless what volume is a nanobot? A few cubic microns. I think the year 1998 has just brought us some time. So in the swarm it says, what do you mean you've run out of addresses? We should have migrated from IP6 years ago. <laughs> so fortunately, I think IP6 really does give us scope, unless you're really talking about nanobots having slash 64s or something. I think we'll be fine for quite a while. And this is a little bit off topic for just an ISP update and something I thought I'd introduce here. Should IP6 be mandatory? Well, EU, EU law under net neutrality requires providers of internet access service shall treat all traffic equally when providing internet access services without discrimination, restriction or interference and irrespective of sender or receiver, the content accessed or distributed, the application or services used and provided or the terminal equipment used. Now that sounds to me very much like you can't discriminate and not do IP6. What if the receiver is an IP6 only website? Well, 
Berwick, who provide guidance on EU net neutrality, do mention IP6 once in their 43-page document. They consider an IP4-only service doesn't mean you're not a provider of internet access service. But that's only a comment on the definition of internet access service. They don't comment on the obligations of an internet access service provider not to discriminate. They just say that you're still an internet access service provider subject to those non-discrimination obligations. So that's an interesting possibility. Perhaps IP6 Council should uh, consider further. Unfortunately, we don't know whether that's really the law or not because it comes down to someone making a, a ruling. And so far, as far as I know, there's been no EU enforcement action on any aspect of net neutrality yet. But you never know, one day it might be decided and maybe suddenly it will be mandatory. Finally, a bit on some of the issues we've had with customers and IP6. Now, I think we can all agree NAT is fairly evil. There's lots of good reasons why NAT breaks the fundamental principles of how IP is meant to work, IP4, IP6. So the discussion you have with people who have whatever reason don't like NAT or have problems with it is to use IP6. And they go on and say, but I've got this sort of implicit firewall, firewall with IP4 and NAT. People can't get into my network. Now, thankfully, the answer is that IP6 routers, the CPE that we ship, has incoming firewalling on by default. So consumers are protected from direct attacks to their network. But then how do they host a game or run a service or a website or whatever behind that? They've got a faff about configuring their firewall, which is a pain. So maybe they need things like UPnP. So you then have to think, OK, how do we do that? What's the best way? There is a protocol called PCP, which is RFC 6887, which does work for IP6 and IP4 and allows you to create mapping rules for IP4 through NAT and firewall holes for IP6. But I think it's fairly new, and we're not quite sure what supports it and what doesn't. We've just put it in our Firebricks, so that customers with Firebricks as CPE can use PCP to make firewall holes. The, the challenge there was making a configuration to determine exactly what devices on my LAN are allowed to make what holes in the firewall for what reasons. It's quite, quite fun to get the config right. You don't just let any device make any hole you like. And it is a security issue because anything on your LAN that can send a UDP packet can make a firewall hole if you're not careful. Same with UPnP. So it's a little bit of a challenge, but we put that in and we're trying to see if anything is using it. Are there games consoles using it? One of the things that fooled me slightly on this when I thought about it is, you know, does Mac support it? Does Windows support it? And so on. And it didn't occur to me initially, but it's nothing to do with does Mac or Windows support it. It's to do with whether the application supports it. Any app running on any of these devices can decide it will send a packet to the router to open a firewall. Now, the operating system might make that easy, might provide support for that, might make it simple for a games console to say it wants a port open and it handles that behind the scenes. But generally, it's not the operating system, it's the applications. It's interesting to see how can we encourage people to, to use this so that they don't have the problem of their nice... IP6 fully routable network locked down behind a firewall that the average user can't really sensibly configure. Thanks for your time. Um, our website, Firebrick website, my blog, and um, Loops of Zen UK. I didn't, make, I didn't invent the game, but we wrote it. It's really quite a fun game, but it's IP6 only website, which is a good example to use. Okay, any questions? Hi, um, Piers O'Han. That was my <coughs> laptop. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned before you had problems with sort of finding IPv6 transit. I was wondering sort of what the situation was now, whether you'd done any performance measurements sort of comparing, say, latency and uh, throughput and so on with them. Um, uh, well, the good news now is that pretty much all the transit providers we deal with do have IP6 natively. So that some, a few years ago, that... That suddenly happened, they all started doing, which was good. Um, but I haven't really looked at performance. Um, we have seen some interesting cases where the same host on IP6 was substantially quicker than IP4, but I imagine it's just a different route through the particular networks in question. So whether there's really a performance difference, I, I wouldn't like to say. I haven't done proper analysis on that, sorry. Okay, thanks. 
At all. Did you, um, did you happen to find any notable applications that were actually using PCP for port forwarding? Um, very good question. I don't think I've found anything using PCP. I found stuff using NAT PMP, which is IP4 only and almost identical. Um, things like um, uh, Sync Thing and uh, I believe uTorrent does as well. I don't, it might have been uTorrent was using PCP, I'm not sure. Um, we, we've only really just started trying to find applications and devices that do this. It's only a few weeks ago we put it in the, in the release. What about the new um, IGD2 UPnP spec? So the new V6 firewall functions and that? I've deliberately avoided UPnP because everyone tells me it's a can of worms. So we, we've gone for PCP at the moment. But it will be interesting to see how that goes in terms of devices and applications and, and what, what route that takes. If everyone goes down UPnP doing this, then we'll have to, we'll have to code something for that. On the games console thing, I, we had a chat to the, um, the Xbox guys, and they were they were pretty keen to not use those kind of dynamic port opening protocols, and rather just use IPsec. So I can't remember the RFC that says. Oh, so the IPsec out to somewhere, and therefore they've got a channel in. Yeah, so I can't remember the. Um, 1692. Yeah. Okay, you know, 1692 says to basically allow unsolicited inbound IPsec from residential CPEs for Ooh. IPv6. Um, so do that because that's what Xbox One uses. That's interesting. Um, Obviously, with our firewalling on the Firebrick, we do allow symmetric traffic. So if the, if the device itself makes an outgoing connection to an IP6 server, we'll, you'll have two-way traffic. But it's for the PMP, so you need unsolicited inbound. OK, interesting one. We might, uh, we're, obviously, the configuration allows you to do that. It's just not on by default. So that's an interesting point. OK, so thank you very much for the questions. We need to keep things moving along. Adrian has will also be available, I'm sure, to uh, chat during the breaks as well. So thanks very much, Adrian. OK. Hi. Yeah, Rafke said the bar high, so my presentation won't be that good. Um, so hi, my name is Laszlo Fintor. I'm uh, head of network design for Hyperoptic. Thank you for the opportunity for presenting here because um, this is our first time we, we speak publicly about um, what we do. Um, so I joined Hyperoptic uh, this year, um, early January, so most of the design we have done here um, has been uh, work of my colleague Mandars. Um, uh, so that's the shout out. Um, so I think the elephant in, this, in the room um, is, is CGN. Um, I just want to get it uh, out of the way. Um, uh, this is something I think everyone has to deal with. Um, be dealing with it. Um, uh, um, if you if you're in a position that that you have a lot of IPs, I think it will be only a question of time before um, the price goes up and your bosses decide to sell it. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, then, if you if you don't, you're already dealing with this problem. Um, uh, so, so this is this is just one one more factor in in that complex cost picture you you have to build when you're building a business case. Where you spend your money, you spend it on on V4 addresses, you spend it on CGN, um, or or you just do something in between. Uh, it, it's not going to be nice. So, so learn to love it. Um, about the company quickly, um, we've been founded about seven years ago. Um, uh, we primarily focus on, on uh, MDUs. Um, we basically go on a case-by-case -case basis. We, we enable um, a, a building with, with uh, sufficient density. Uh, we put a lease line in the basement and uh, and then basically cable up the building in Cat5. That was the old model. Now we um, uh, run our own fiber uh, in VT ducts, uh, especially in Docklands. Um, and uh, we do fiber to the home. Um, so that's, that's where we're heading. Um, um, grown significantly in the last few years. We're now in 28 cities in the UK, especially the ma uh, major metropolitan area. So our um, uh, 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 focus is, is basically to, to become a large, uh, large metro ISP over time, over time. And uh, the, primarily we provide residential broadband. So we have a very small percentage of, of business users. 
Um, so as I kind of hinted at, um, uh, we are a relative newcomer. Um, we, we were not lucky enough to, to have large IP allocations <coughs> and it kind of wasn't on the ball to, 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 to get our allocations uh, sorted early enough and uh, um, so we've been caught out with, with shortage and um, so we've been forced to introduce CG, CGNAT last year. Um, which is expensive. Um, um, I mean, if you haven't done it, you will find out. Um, uh, so the uh, for us, V6 was was uh, uh, basically it's just blunting that blow um, to to basically start uh, enabling it and and, and offloading um, uh, as much of, of of CGN as possible. Um, so. Um, what was the plan? Uh, we, we put this plan into motion in, um, in, in uh, early or late last year, late 2016. Um, pretty basic, so we, we, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, uh, dual stack, um, uh, we, we do slash 50, uh, 56 preface delegation per uh, CPE. And um, uh, one thing we, we had early on was um, basically V6 native transport for DNS. That's a bit of a, um, a novelty for us. Um, previously, we haven't done it in my previous place. Um, um, we have a rooted network. So um, uh, our network is different from from that of a traditional ISP, which relies on, 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 on ADSL, uh, VDSL. Um, and, and a layer two aggregation network that comes together in, a, in an LNS or, or in a BRAS where, where you have hundreds of thousands of customers and on, on one layer three device when you just, I don't want to, uh, to uh, uh, trivialize this, but you just basically flick a switch and then everything is V6 enabled. Um, we have a rooted network, so that means that hundreds and thousands of devices all need to be individually enabled um, to, to enable V6 on them. Um, and since we are, as I said, about seven years old, we have, uh, uh, curiously, about four generation of equipment in the, in the network. So, um, and on paper, all of these, these are basically switches, layer three and layer two switches. These are all support on paper and on uh, uh, V6, but in reality, when it came to the, 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 the more finessed um, the details, then they turn out that they, these features didn't always work. So, um, so that was, that was uh, probably the biggest issue to what to do on, on two, three, four generations old uh, devices. So the answer to that was that um, our vendor came up with a, with a, with a patch for it, which is um, really nice of them. Um, uh, yes, and uh, some of the features um, are just not there on, on, on V6. Um, so, for example, we use something like um, um, uh, a portal, uh, like, like a redirection, a, a kind of captive portal for, for customers who move into their home, turn on their internet, and um, uh, basically they, they, they get a captive portal if you want to uh, have internet. Uh, access then just call this number kind of thing. So that kind of redirection uh, is V4 only, uh, unfortunately. So that, that is going to be a bit of a stumbling block in, in the future when we are going to go for native V4 from, from uh, sorry, native V6 from, from dual stack. Um, so it means that we we'll probably in the future we have to keep a little bit of private V4 in the network just for that um, portal redirection functionality. Um, so progress, um, we, we completed the network design um, quite early uh, this year. Um, uh, testing, um, again, since we had a relatively limited amount of devices to, to work with, we have only one CP, or, uh, one CP vendor, three CPs, but uh, majority of CPs is just one model. So we've been uh, kind of lucky with that. Um, and it's been very, very smoothly. The, I, uh, I know that CP testing and CP development is, is, is a, a probably the most difficult part of any, any V6 migration. Um, our vendor is ZTE and uh, 
you know, they must have done it before um, because anything we've been asking for uh, 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 feature-wise uh, came along nicely. So um, any um, any new uh, subscriber, any any new development, so basically any new MDU we roll out um, is enabled day one, um, and then we kind of slowly working through uh, the existing estate and, and migrating it. So the, the, the uh, challenge here um, uh, with the rollout is, as I said, um, uh, we ha don't have a single point uh, or, or we don't have centralized points where, where routing happens, where the migration has to be done. We have to do this on, on uh, if you have a large estate, like for example, East Village, which, which has like 100 uh, active devices, you probably have to do it overnight and have to uh, change the config. We also um, leveraged uh, this project as a, a kind of um, uh, a patching of uh, or paying back some technical debt. So basically, we are making sure we we um, bringing uh, firmware everywhere uh, to to a standard uh, version. Um, uh, you know, update ACLs. Uh, you know, it, it's just a, to it, it's a wave of standardization sweeping through. Um, in the in the uh, wake of, of of the V6 rollout as well, so we we kind of bolted on a couple of things. Um, so um, it, it's it's moving relatively slowly because of this. Um, uh, I checked yesterday; we've been uh, we are around four percent of the network. I'm I'm uh, not obliged to to disclose numbers uh, of subscribe uh, number of subscribers, but uh, we are hoping to. To, to finish the, the rollout process by, um, by, by quarter two next year, so sometime uh, hopefully before the summer. Um, uh, a little bit about uh, uh, the architecture. Um, I didn't really uh, prepare a, a, a low-level design slide, but basically we have uh, layer two switches um, connecting uh, subscribers directly. Um, and we have a layer three aggregation uh, uh, above that. Um, so you can uh, think of it as an enterprise network um, uh, to a degree. Um, we, we, uh, the layer two switches do, uh, so basically the, the customers and the layer two switches share a LAN. So obviously we had to pay attention to, to, to the security um, uh, uh, on those. So we, uh, we have to prevent all that uh, nasty uh, uh, hijacking attempts uh, that would take place normally on a, on a shared VLAN. So basically you, you have uh, um, a, a private VLAN-like uh, architecture when, when uh, users can, can only uh, access the layer 3 switch. Um, just like we have done with uh, DHCP spoofing, ARP spoofing, for V6 we introduced um, uh, DHCP V6 spoofing. Um, uh, 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 neighbor discovery um, uh, spoofing. So, um, so it's it's pretty locked down. So you, you can't really um, uh, interfere with, with with your neighbor's traffic. Um, <clears throat> in in terms of um, um, uh, uh, routing, we uh, locally we um, uh, the CPU van address, the northbound interfaces, receives um, uh, an IP. V6 address via Slack, um, uh, and uh, the LAN is is uh, the HCP V6 prefix delegation. So um, interestingly, the, um, the the layer three switch has a feature which can add, uh, based on snooping the DHCP request, um, a static route uh, pointing well static route um, uh, uh, pointing at the uh, link local address. So basically to uh, of the CP basically to the northbound van address of the CP for the slash fan, uh, 56 that's been delegated via uh, the HCP v6. And uh, so that's how you actually have a shared LAN, but, but, but basically it's a, it's a, it's a routed network um, uh, with, with multiple default routes pointing to, uh, to, to the various CPEs, um, and these routes are the slash 56s. I think that was the last slide. Thank you very much. Any questions? Anthony is there. He's coming. All right. How 
do you stop someone taking that uh, the DHCP uh, Slack address and then receiving the uh, default route? I know on the NBN rollout in Australia they had a, I think, a MAC address tied to the uh, to the switch port. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, so the because um, um, it's a single va VLAN, so I'm yeah. assuming it's a, a single slash. 64 for the yeah it's it's link uh, we we use link local addresses so the we uh, we use the router announcement from layer three switch um, uh, for for the default route for the default gateway okay. uh, how do we prevent it um, uh, it's layer two lockdown um, so in a way um, we uh, it's like imagine it as like a private VLAN um, no one else can send it. Uh, that particular scenario. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take it online, offline because I can't answer it from the top of my head. Yeah. Okay, if there's no more questions, Thank thanks very much. And the final sort of, sort of ISP update um, is Andrew Hudson from the BBC. And I think Craig also wants to... He's going to loiter in the corner. Plug at the end. Might be a double yeah. act. Okay. <laughs> well, questions. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're from the BBC. Uh, I'm Andrew Hudson. This is Craig Taylor. Uh, we are both lead architects in the BBC's online technology group, uh, or OTG for short. Uh, OTG is the part of the BBC that provides the foundation services and infrastructure that power BBC Online. Sounds like a marketing strapline, doesn't it? Um, so what we've enabled so far, um, HTTP redirect services were kind of one of the first classes of services we enabled. Um, that's, that's mainly because they're the simplest thing. There's not really a lot that can go wrong when all, all you're doing is issuing a, an HTTP redirect. Um, so that includes our zone apexes, bbc.co.uk and bbc.com. All they do is take the URL that you requested, put triple W on the front of it and issue a 301. Um, we've also got 600 or so virtual sites, um, which uh, include things like Vanity Domain, so bbcpigeon.com is an example of that. I like that one because I think the site's a great example of what the World Service can do. Um, and uh, some archive sites, which actually aren't redirect services, so they arguably should be on a, on a different, uh, different line, but um, John Watson blog was an example I, I picked out of uh, that one. Um, we've also done most of our third-party CDN endpoints for static assets. Um, we haven't done AV media just yet. Uh, we haven't quite got that far yet. Um, some of the static endpoints that haven't been done are, are mainly those that are, that are managed by product teams themselves rather than uh, by OTG. Uh, static DNS uh, via a third-party provider, Newstar, that we use for, for that. So bbc.co.uk is delegated to the name servers that, that have v6 addresses. Uh, I say static as opposed to dynamic, um, which uh, is the part of the DNS where we have TYP for, uh, for certain services, uh, record weighting and, and configurable operational switches and things like that. That's not v6 yet, and we run that ourselves. Um, also some staff productivity tools, so our internal ticketing system, which is JIRA, uh, and our documentation system, Confluence, they're both uh, V6 enabled. The reason we pick those is because um, staff are kind of friendly users, if you like, so if there's some kind of problem with our V6 deployment, uh, A, they're using these tools all the time, day in, day out, and B, they're likely to uh, give us helpful feedback rather than just complain or say nothing. Um, so that's why we pick those ones. Um, and lots of pre-production endpoints, um, mostly kind of just uh, in preparation for when we do uh, the live rollout of the same things. Uh, so why have we not done more? Um, so our, our self-hosted endpoints are, are mostly held up uh, on some outstanding third-party dependencies um, to do with network flow monitoring and, and things like that. Um, we also need to work out how to deal with uh, conflicts in GOIP when there's a mix of V4 and V6 on a particular system. So um, a couple of examples of that to, to, to put it into context. So between our, our mediation system, uh, which is an application called Media Selector, uh, and is responsible for giving out uh, 
the CDN endpoints where you'll get media from. Uh, it also does access control and, and things like that. Uh, and the distribution systems themselves, i.e. the CDN. So you can imagine if uh, we've got V4 enabled on one and V6, uh, sorry, V6 enabled on one and not on the other, we might have a situation where media selector says, yeah, you can get access to this iPlayer stream, you're in the UK, and then the CDN says, oh, no, you're not, because you're on the V6 address rather than V4 or vice versa. Uh, so we need to figure out how to deal with that. Um, we have a kind of similar problem with our audience feedback system, which is only V4 enabled currently. Um, so if we enabled V6 in, in, in a load of services and then somebody contacts us saying, contacts us saying uh, iPlayer says I'm not in the UK, then we get their IPv4 address because that's what they contacted us via, unless they helpfully tell us their V6 address. Uh, and then we can't really do a lot with that. Um, so ideally, that system would capture both the V4 and the V6 address, technically possible, but, but work involved. Um, but in practice, we'll probably just end up enabling uh, V6 on it and then we'll get, get whichever one. Um, and yeah, these can be solved, we just need a bit more time. Uh, so some things we've had to deal with along the way. Um, it's a bit of a theme with GOIP here, I guess. Uh, so um, because of the problem I mentioned before, um, there's also, if you enable V6 everywhere, then does 20% of your iPlayer population suddenly lose access because of lots of data errors? Uh, so we decided to take, uh, undertake a, an exercise in validating the, um, the accuracy of our V6 data. Um, there's a few slides on, on how we did this because it's a bit fiddly to talk through. Um, so there's our client, which in this case was our standard media player, uh, or SMP. Um, so we added some code to SMP to make a request to a, a V4-only geolocation service uh, and say, am I in the UK? We did just UK or not, because that's kind of mainly what we're involved in, uh, mainly what we're interested in. Um, we didn't do individual countries. Uh, that service responded with UK or not UK, back to the client. Um, the client then sent the result to a dual stack stat service, so connecting over V6 if the client supported it. And then that gives us a nice log file with uh, lots of IPv6 addresses and uh, what we thought they were, UK or not, based on their v4 address. So then we could compare that with uh, what our v6 GIP database actually says for those v6 addresses, if that makes sense. Um, so we found, uh, based on that exercise, about 99 and a bit percent uh, match for v4 versus v6 uh, with respect to UK or not UK, um, which is fairly good. Um, Obviously, there's, we'd like it to be 100%, so uh, we did raise the, the mismatches with our, our data provider. Um, a handful of them were actually errors in the V6 data, which were corrected, only a, only a small number. Um, the rest of them were actually considered correct, uh, and they actually cited an example where we'd said, we think these V6 addresses are in the UK, and they said, well, they belong to an ISP that doesn't even operate in the UK, so that's not possible. Um, we don't know for sure why that is, but I suspect it's something to do with uh, VPNs or smart DNS proxies or something like that that are, that are causing differences. Uh, we had to enable v6 on our load test tooling. Um, interestingly, we saw, uh, or continue to see, in fact, about a 1% or 2% performance improvement uh, with v6 over v4 fairly consistently. Um, monitoring tools, because we can't deploy a service that we can't monitor in, uh, we can't monitor, so, so our monitoring systems have to be v6 enabled. Uh, engineering networks, kind of similar reasons. We don't want to be deploying services where the people that develop them and operate them can't see the services the audience can see it. Um, and in doing that, we've, we've discovered, or at least I discovered, perhaps other people do, <laughs> um, that the BBC laptops don't have V6 enabled by default uh, on, on Mac or Windows. Um, you can turn it on, of course, but that's an, an interesting observation. Um, and ensuring that things that process logs understand IPv6, because uh, if something's been hard-coded to know that uh, numbers dot numbers dot numbers dot numbers is going to be at the start of the log line, and then suddenly it's something different, then they're, they're potentially going to fail. Um, happily, we haven't actually found anything with that problem yet. Um, hopefully people have been having V6 in mind for, for a while now. Um, and also, um, we need to make sure we didn't break H2 connection sharing. So um, uh, if you've got a service that's got two endpoints at the moment and they're both V4, and then suddenly one of them you enable V6 on, then the DNS doesn't resolve to the same thing anymore and they cease sharing connections. So we've had to make sure that where we've got lots of hosts on the same uh, page, that they all move to dual stack all at once or in a short space of time so that we don't break that. Uh, some quick stats then, uh, kind of roughly in the order I mentioned the services we've enabled. Um, so this is uh, for a not-so-random Thursday in uh, November, the day before I did the slides. Um, so this is for bbc.co.uk and bbc.com. Um, slightly surprisingly low uptake, about 4%, and this is a 24-hour period. Um, fairly flat, though, apart from a couple of blips, not 100% sure what they are, possibly on-air call to actions or something like that. Um, my guess is the reason they're a bit low is uh, that there's perhaps a lot of automated monitoring uh, and bot usage on, on this host. We, we see a lot of people that use uh, these hosts as, as things for, is the internet working for my network and stuff like that, uh, which perhaps is more, more prevalent on V4. 
Um, this is the, the same set of information for the virtual sites. Average uptake a bit higher and more consistent with what we see across the board. Very variable on, on virtual sites. Um, I think that's mostly because it's fairly low traffic, but also we sometimes get uh, v6 enabled clients crawling feed URLs that are on these and that sort of increases the v6 usage briefly and then goes away again. Um, slightly more interesting stuff then, this is for uh, the static assets on the same day. Um, again, average uptake is fairly consistent with what we see across the board, about 15%. Um, you can see the time of day variation there, which uh, was alluded to earlier as well, which, which supports the, the, the theory that um, office uptake is, is less than that of, of home uptake. So you can see in the, in the morning and in the evenings, there's more V6 usage than during the day. I think if you saw this on a weekend day, it wouldn't show that actually. Um, Within that, there's uh, something like 100 discrete hosts behind that data, um, and actually we see variation between the hosts as well for different use cases. So um, the hosts that supply our, our navigation assets are around 15%, uh, the host that provides our standard media players is around 17%, um, and some of our legacy hosts are around 19%, so uh, it does vary by use case. Uh, some slightly longer term stats, the same set of hosts um, for a few months. Um, you can see again the office versus home usage here, so the, the bits that are a bit higher are weekend days and then you've got the flat bit during the week. Um, so we enabled some additional hosts on the 4th of September as well, which is why there's a, a bit of an increase there, what we call our files hosts, for no reason other than that they have the word files in their host name. Um, another thing we can do for, for kind of a, a, a longer still term of uh, view of, of uptake is look at our DNS, because that's provided by a third party and they hopefully have a stats portal. Um, so that's around 10% um, from the beginning of the year to just before the end of November. Um, fairly flat, or it looks fairly flat on that graph anyway. Um, but remember that the clients of this are actually not, generally speaking, end users. They're mostly uh, cash and resolvers like ISP caches and things like that. So it's, it's not necessarily representative of general uptake. Um, looking at just the V6 numbers, so taking away the V4, you can actually see a bit of variation. Um, I'm not quite sure what happened in March and April, I haven't, fig haven't figured that out why they're a bit lower. Um, but if you had a trend line, it is going at least in the right direction. Um, and even if you remove March and April, it's still going roughly in, right the, direction, in the right direction, if uh, at a much reduced gradient. Uh, so that's it. Just before questions, though, if there are any, um, Craig wanted to make a shameless plug for something. Yeah. So, <laughs> Yes. Um, uh, my colleagues in R&D are um, uh, trying to uh, draw up some interest or interested um, uh, uh, eyeball networks or service provider networks um, that might um, want to look at IPv6 multicast native. Oh, I heard some wincing. Um, so um, if uh, anyone has interest in IPv6 multicast, or specifically uh, coming to uh, talk and maybe have a small workshop with us on it, um, uh, please would you uh, uh, grab me at an opportune time. Thank you. Um, to give some context, maybe, actually, uh, we're, we're talking about um, a sort of progressive um, um, multi uh, quick over multicast protocol for media delivery. Um, so that's one of the things we're looking to uh, work with here. OK, thank you. Are there any questions for Greg or Andrew? I wonder if uh, random probing from... Just wait for the microphone just so we can um, pick it up on the recording. Mm -hmm. Come down to the... I wonder if uh, random probing from script kiddies and so on is partly to explain why you've got most of it. Can I have your six. attention, please? Can I have your attention, please? <laughs> that was a fire alarm or something. City of London Police are currently dealing with an incident in St Martin Le Grand. We have been advised to ask residents to move away from the windows that face out onto St Martin Le Grand. I think we're okay. That is by Tesco's and Maplin and side reception. Please could you move away from those windows into the centre of the building. So the restaurant, the terraces, the downstairs cafe. The police have advised that they will update us as soon as they have further information. We will be walking the building to advise customers of this matter as well. Thank you for your cooperation. Oh, that's dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> BBC bringing you great drama every day. There's something going yeah, you on don't outside. want to know what's going on outside. You're really well protected here. It's still here. The first time, you know, when IPv6 in danger. 
<laughs> well, hopefully we stay safe, you know, we just, it's okay. It's Sorry. okay. So there was a question. Yeah, so I was wondering how much uh, random probing from script kiddies and so on might explain why you've got mostly IPv4? I, I on on the zone apexes? Or, um, yeah, I think, I think it is it's a mixture of that. And also, like I said, people, people, at least historically, and probably still set up like things like Nagios to probe the internet and they, they have to use something to, to test if the internet's there. And we see loads of that, actually. People hitting bbc.co.uk from, from things like Nagios. Um, Probably deployed on on thing on host environments that don't have V6 support. So I think a lot of it is that. Yeah. There's a load of default automatons that use that at startup. Yo, hey, Michael with Facebook. Uh, one question. Uh, well, not a question. A comment. Uh, in the graph that you mentioned, that you showed those two brief spikes. Uh, in our experience, those spikes in V6 happen when V4 is broken. So actually, when the operator or multiple operators have an actual routing problem in V4, the happy Ables implementation right. or whatever falls back actually to V6. Yeah, I would, so we, we could have a look at whether that was a, a spike in just V6 or whether the, the V4 went down and the V6 went up. Yeah. The, the data's there. I think, so we actually found uh, with an operator in US, routing problems. Um, they were actually having black hole in issues. We enabled v6, and the black hole in problems went away. Right. So they say, "Oh, IPv6, awesome." It's like, well, in this case, it's more like IPv4 is broken. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. But, uh, interesting. But yeah, IPv6 is so awesome. you're saying we should never turn off IPv4 mm -hmm. and just go for logical resilience? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> not to be. <laughs> Quick question. You said you didn't enable any DNS internally as of yet. How are your engineers actually testing for, for V6 for your internal resources? And so resolution works. You can, you can, you can get a quad A resource. It's just for the, the static, but you said for dynamic resources you weren't doing anything yet? Uh, yes. So um, there's only a, a small number of hosts that we have the dynamic on. So bbc.co.uk is, is static. And for uh, use cases where that resolves to a dynamic one, we CNAME it to bbc.net.uk or a, a sub-host of bbc.net.uk, which is our, our dynamic one. Um, so yeah, for things like triple W BBC K UK, uh, you'll find that resolves to triple W BBC Net UK, uh, and those DNS resolvers are not on uh, V4. It doesn't mean they can't give out Quad A records. There is the the uh, dynamic system can still give out Quad A's. It's just the resolvers themselves or the authority itself is not not on Quad A and uh, not on V6 addresses. So yes, <laughs> so six only would not work in short. But uh, you um, so what one of the um, things about our, all of our deployment to date is um, we aren't uh, aiming to support six only right now. Um, there are various parts of the offering that are implicitly requiring dual stack. Um, and uh, I think our, our short term goals um, are consistent with that. Hi, Javid from, Hi, Javid from Netflix. Hi, um, what are your plans for supporting or oh, what's your roadmap for uh, V6 streaming for BBC iPlayer traffic? Um, so that's kind of held up indirectly by uh, our ability to deploy to our own self-hosted thing. So probably what we're going to do is want to, is want to enable V6 on Media Selector before we do that. Um, we think that's going to be unblocked around March, um, at which point hopefully we'll start uh, enabling V6 on, on media distribution endpoints for, for streaming. So you're looking to serve traffic using V6 on third-party CDNs or just your internal one as well? Sorry? Is it, is it just V6 on your... Um, own CDN, or are you uh, looking at the, the objective is all three? So all we, three. we use we use two third parties and, and our own as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's there's nothing technically stopping it being turned on on all of those right now, apart from the kind of indirect things I mentioned. Um, so yeah, it'll be all three of them. Perhaps the, perhaps not all at exactly the same time, but yeah. The way we've been releasing so far has been that we don't want to make any um, uh, operation operational compromises when we push something six out. So um, we're actually following the same workflow as if we were releasing a service for four. Um, and so if we can't follow that as is, um, uh, then it gets stuck. Um, and so that's where, where we are at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, towards the middle of next year, I think. Great, thank you very much. Thanks. We are very happy that uh, BBC are enabling IPv6 because I guess everybody in this room, unless you are from outside the UK, you watch content on iPlayer.
right? So like this is also going to drive V6 traffic in the UK nicely. Well, now we've got Jimon Awards. And uh, I would like to ask first Tim if he could say a few words about Jim Bound because we found out recently that uh, not everybody knows who this great person was and what it actually means to receive this award. So uh, people from the companies that are going to be recognized, could I ask you to come a little bit closer to us here? <laughs> Go ahead. Yep. Uh, okay, so Veronica just asked me to say <coughs> a quick few words about Jim. Um, he was an amazing guy who sadly passed away in 2009, if I, if I recall correctly. So he was one of the guys that was in there from the start with the V6 um, work in the ITF in like the mid-90s. Uh, he was at HP, I think, at the time. Uh, and he was a tremendous driving force for getting things to happen. He really, you know, he said what he thought and uh, he brought people along with him and uh, caused a lot of V6 work to happen that might otherwise not have. Um, I know him from when we were at our university doing some deployment back in 97 or 98. Uh, he heard about that and he was offering, in fact, sent free hardware over for us for students to use and for projects and so on. And he carried that on through into another project three or four, later, three or four years later called Sixnet. He was tremendously generous, uh, had a you know, really high degree of integrity and professionalism. And uh, I think that's why Latif Ladid, the president of the RPV6 Forum, decided um, to name these wards after him. And sadly, I, I couldn't find any pictures of him online to throw up on the slides there. But he was a tremendous guy and um, very much missed by an awful lot of people. But um, that's why these awards are named after him. Thanks.